Sleep with Gina Marie. I'm Gina, and I am so glad you're here. Marie says hi, and as always, I have got a classic story for you from an award-winning author. And thank you for all you do to make sure we stay right here. Thanks for telling your friends. We are so thrilled. Who is the we? My dog is not even in the room. I am so thrilled to bring you today's story. We have featured this author before, and we did it with his very first published work, which, by the way, was his most awarded. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? The Specialty of the House. Yep, that's the name of it. It was our episode number 263, and the author, Mr. Stanley Ellen. If you have not heard this episode, do whatever you have to do, but listen to it. Don't miss it. Because Mr. Ellen was a true master of the short story, and later, detective novels as well. Um, And as we pointed out to you before, in episode 263, Stanley Ellen was one of Ellery Queen's favorites. Mr. Ellen was born and he died in New York. He graduated from college at just 19 years of age. He was a steel worker, a dairy farm manager, uh, a teacher, and he served in the Army during World War II. Here's a weird little fact about today's story. It's all about a tool. Hmm. You'll see what I mean soon. Stanley Ellen was married his whole life And that's a little different from many of the authors we discuss on this podcast. He was married his whole life to only one woman, Jean Michael, who was an editor and a critic, and it was she who convinced him to turn his love for literature into a writing career. And I am very glad she did. Well, Rightly so, many have complained that Stanley Ellen is often overlooked as a contributor to 20th century fiction. He is one of my favorite storytellers, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be one of yours, too, if he isn't already. Tell me what you think about it. Tuck in, everybody, for Stanley Ellen's The Cat's Paw. There was little to choose among any of the rooms in the boarding house, in their dingy, linoleum-floored, brass-bedsteaded uniformity. But the day he answered the advertisement on the Help Wanted page, Mr. Crabtree realized that one small advantage accrued to his room. The public telephone in the hallway was opposite his door. And simply by keeping an ear cocked, he could be at the instrument a moment after the first shrill warning ring had sounded. In view of this, he closed his application for employment not only with his signature, but with the number of the telephone as well. His hand shook a little as he did so. He felt party to a gross deception in implying that the telephone was his personal property. But the prestige to be gained this way, so he thought, might somehow weight the balance in his favor. To that end, he tremorously sacrificed the unblemished principles of a lifetime. The advertisement itself had been 
nothing less than a miracle. Man wanted, it said, for hard work at moderate pay. Sober, honest, industrious, former clerk, age 45 to 50, preferred. Write all details, box 111. And Mr. Crabtree, peering incredulously through his spectacles, had read it with a shuddering dismay at the thought of all his fellows, age 45 to 50, who might be seeking hard work at moderate pay and who might have read the same notice minutes or perhaps hours before. His answer could have served as a model letter of application for employment. His age was 48. His health, excellent. He was unmarried. He had served one single firm for 30 years, had served it faithfully and well, had an admirable record for attendance and punctuality. Unfortunately, the firm had merged with another and larger. Regrettably, many capable employees had to be released. Hours? Unimportant. His only interest was in doing a good job, no matter the time involved. Salary? A matter entirely in the hands of his prospective employer. His previous salary had been $50 per week, but naturally that had come after years of proved worth. Available for an interview at any time. References from the following. The signature and then the telephone number. All this had been written and rewritten a dozen times until Mr. Crabtree had been satisfied that every necessary word was there, each word in its proper place. Then, in the copperplate hand that had made his ledgers a thing of beauty, the final draft had been transferred to a fine bond paper purchased toward this very contingency and posted. After that, alone with his speculations on whether a reply would come by mail, by telephone, or not at all, Mr. Crabtree spent two endless and heart-fluttering weeks until the moment when he answered a call and heard his name come over the wire like the crack of doom. Yes, he said shrilly. I'm Crabtree. I sent a letter. Calmly, Mr. Crabtree, calmly said the voice. It was a clear, thin voice, which seemed to pick up and savor each syllable before delivering it, and it had an instant and chilling effect on Mr. Crabtree, who was clutching the telephone as if pity could be squeezed from it. I have been considering your application, the voice went on, with the same painful deliberation, and I am most gratified by it, most gratified, but before calling the matter settled, I should like to make clear the terms of employment I am offering. You would not object to my discussing it now. Oh, the word employment rang dizzily through Mr. Crabtree's head. No, he said, please do. 
Very well. First of all, do you feel capable of operating your own establishment? My own establishment? Oh, have no fears about the size of the establishment or the responsibilities involved. It is a matter of some confidential reports which must be drawn up regularly. You would have your own office, your name on the door, and, of course, no supervision directly over you. That should explain the need for an exceptionally reliable man. Yes, said Mr. Crabtree. But um, those confidential reports, your office, will be supplied with a list of several important corporations. It will also receive subscriptions to a number of financial journals which frequently make mention of those same corporations. You will note all such references as they appear, and at the end of each day consolidate them into a report which will be mailed to me. I must add that none of this calls for any theoretical work or literary treatment. Accuracy, brevity, clarity. Those are the three measures to go by. You understand that, of course. Yeah, yes, indeed, said Mr. Crabtree, fervently. Excellent, said the voice. Now, your hours will be from nine to five, six days a week, with an hour off at noon for lunch. I must stress this. I am insistent on punctuality, and attendance, and I expect you to be as conscientious about these things as if you were under my personal supervision every moment of the day. I hope I do not offend you when I emphasize this. Oh, no, no, sir, said Mr. Crabtree. I let me continue, the voice said. Here is the address where you will appear one week from today and the number of your room. Mm, Mr. Crabtree, without pencil or paper at hand, pressed the numbers frantically into his memory. And the office will be completely prepared for you. The door will be open and you will find Two keys in a drawer of the desk, one for the door and one for the cabinet in the office. In the desk, you will also find the list I mentioned, as well as the materials needed in making out your reports. In the cabinet, you will find a stock of periodicals to start work on. Um, I, b I beg your pardon, said Mr. Crabtree, but those reports, they should contain every single item of interest about the corporations on your list, from business transactions to changes in personnel, and they must be mailed to me immediately upon your leaving the office each day. Is that clear? Um, only one thing, said Mr. Crabtree. To whom, uh, where do I mail them? Oh, a pointless question, said the voice sharply, much to Mr. Crabtree's alarm. To the box number which you are already familiar. Of course. Oh, of course, said Mr. Crabtree. Now, said the voice, with a gratifying return to its original deliberate tones. The question of salary. I have given it a good deal of thought since, as you must realize, there are a number of factors involved. In the end, I let myself be guided by the ancient maximum. A good workman is worthy of his hire. 
You recall those words? Yes, said Mr. Crabtree. And, the voice said, a poor workman can be easily dispensed with. On that basis, I am prepared to offer you fifty-two dollars a week. Is that satisfactory? Mr. Crabtree stared at the telephone dumbly and then recovered his voice. <laughs> very, he gasped. Oh, very much so. I must confess I never... The voice brought him up sharply. But that is conditional, you understand. You will be, to use a rather clumsy term, on probation until you have proved yourself. Either the job is handled to perfection, or there is no job. Mr. Crabtree felt his knees turn to water at the grim suggestion. I'll do my best, he said. I most certainly will do my absolute best. And the voice went on relentlessly. I attach great significance to the way you observe the confidential nature of your work. It is not to be discussed with anyone and since the maintenance of your office and supplies lies entirely in my hands, there can be no excuse for a defection. I have also removed temptation in the form of a telephone, which you will not find on your desk. I hope I do not seem unjust in my abhorrence of the common practice where employees waste their time in idle conversation during work hours. Since the death of an only sister twenty years before, there was not a soul in the world who would have dreamed of calling Mr. Crabtree to make any sort of conversation whatsoever. But he only said, No, sir, absolutely not. Then you are in agreement with all the terms we have discussed? Yes, sir, said Mr. Crabtree. Any further questions? One thing, uh, said Mr. Crabtree, my salary, uh, how it will reach you at the end of each week, the voice said, in cash. Anything else? Mr. Crabtree's mind was now a veritable logjam of questions, but he found it impossible to fix on any particular one. Before he could do so, the voice said crisply, Good luck, then. And there was the click which told him his caller had hung up. It was only when he attempted to do the same that he discovered his hand had been clenched so tightly around the receiver that it cost him momentary anguish to disengage it. It must be admitted that the first time Mr. Crabtree approached the address given him, it would not have surprised him greatly to find no building there at all. But the building was there, reassuring in its immensity, teeming with occupants who packed the banks of elevators solidly and in the hallways looked through him and scurried around him with efficient disinterest. The office was there too, hidden away at the end of a devious corridor of its own, on the very top floor, a fact 
called to Mr. Crabtree's attention by a stairway across the corridor which led up to an open door through which the flat gray of the sky could be seen. The most impressive thing about the office was the Crabtree's affiliated reports boldly stenciled on the door. Opening the door, one entered an incredibly small and narrow room, made even smaller by the massive dimensions of the furniture that crowded it. To the right, immediately inside the door, was a gigantic filing cabinet. Thrust tightly against it, but still so large that it utilized the remainder of the wall space on that side was a huge old-fashioned desk with a swivel chair before it. The window set in the opposite wall was in keeping with the furniture. It was an immense window, broad and high, and its sill came barely above Mr. Crabtree's knees. Ooh. He felt a momentary qualm when he first glanced through it and saw the sheer dizzying drop below, Ooh, the terrifying quality of which was heightened by the blind, windowless walls of the building directly across from him. One look was enough. Henceforth, Mr. Crabtree kept the bottom section of the window securely fastened and adjusted only the top section to his convenience. The keys were in a desk drawer. Mm -hmm. Pen, ink, a box of nibs, parts of pens, a deck of blotters, and a half dozen other accessories more impressive than useful were in another drawer. A supply of stamps was at hand and most pleasant. There was a plentiful supply of stationery, each piece bearing the letterhead Crab Trees, Affiliated Reports the number of the office, and the address of the building. In his delight at this discovery, Mr. Crabtree dashed off a few practice lines with some bold flourishes of the pen, and then, a bit alarmed at his own prodigality, he carefully tore the sheet to minute shreds and dropped it into the wastebasket at his feet. Hmm. After that, his efforts were devoted wholly to the business at hand. The filing cabinet disgorged a dismayingly large file of publications, which had to be poured over line by line, and Mr. Crabtree never finished studying a page without the harrowing sensation that he had somehow bypassed the mention of a name which corresponded to one on the typed list he had found, as promised, in the desk. And then he would retrace the entire page with an awful sense of dallying at his work and groan when he came to the end of it without finding what he had not wanted to find in the first place. It seemed to him at times that he could never possibly deplete the monstrous pile of periodicals before him. Whenever he sighed with pleasure at having made some headway, he would be struck with the gloomy foreknowledge that the next morning would find a fresh delivery of mail at his door and consequently more material to add to the pile. There were, 
However, breaks in this depressing routine. One was the preparation of the daily report, a task which, somewhat to Mr. Crabtree's surprise, he found himself learning to enjoy. The other was the prompt arrival each week of the sturdy envelope containing his salary down to the last dollar bill. Although this was never quite the occasion for unalloyed pleasure, it might have been. Mr. Crabtree would carefully slit open one end of this envelope, remove the money, count it, and place it neatly in his ancient wallet. Then he would poke trembling, exploratory fingers into the envelope, driven by the fearful recollection of his past experience to look for the notice that would tell him his services were no longer required. That was always a bad moment, and it had the unfailing effect of leaving him ill and shaken until he could bury himself in his work again. The work was soon part of him. He had ceased bothering with the typed list. Every name on it was firmly imprinted in his mind, and there were restless nights when he could send himself off to sleep merely by repeating the list a few times. One name in particular had come to intrigue him, merited special attention. Efficiency Instruments Limited was unquestionably facing stormy weather. There had been drastic changes in personnel, talks of a merger, sharp fluctuations on the market. It rather pleased Mr. Crabtree to discover that with the passage of weeks into months, each of the names on his list had taken on a vivid personality for him. Amalgamated, oh, was steady as a rock, stolid in its comfortable success. Universal was high-pitched, fidgety in its exploration of new techniques, and so on, down the line. Mm, But Efficiency Instruments Limited was Mr. Crabtree's pet project, and he had more than once mm, nervously caught himself, giving it perhaps a shade more attention than it warranted. He brought himself up sharply at such times, impartiality must be maintained otherwise. It came without any warning at all. He returned from lunch, punctual as ever, opened the door of the office, and knew He was standing face to face with his employer. Come in, Mr. Crabtree, said the clear, thin voice, and shut the door. Mr. Crabtree closed the door and stood speechless. Hmm. I must be a prepossessing figure, said the visitor with a certain relish, to have such a potent effect on you. You know who I am, 
Of course. To Mr. Crabtree's numbed mind, the large, bulbous eyes fixed unwinkingly on him, the wide, flexible mouth, the body short and round as a barrel, bore a horrifying resemblance to a frog sitting comfortably at the edge of a pond with himself in the unhappy role of a fly hovering close by. I believe, said Mr. Crabtree, shakily, that you are my employer, <laughs> Mr. Oh, Mr. A stout forefinger nudged Mr. Crabtree's ribs playfully. As long as the bills are paid, the name is unimportant. Eh, hey, Mr. Crabtree? However, for the sake of expedience, let me be known to you as, uh, say, uh, George Spelvin. A pseudonym often used by actors who do not otherwise wish to be credited. Have you ever encountered the ubiquitous Mr. Spelvin in your journeyings? Mr. Crabtree. I'm afraid not, said Mr. Crabtree, miserably. Then you are not a playgoer, and that is all to the good. And if I may hazard a guess, you are not one to indulge yourself in literature or the cinema either. I... Do try to keep up with the daily newspaper, said Mr. Crabtree, stoutly. There's a, a, a good deal to read in it, you know, Mr. Spelvin, and it's n not always easy, considering my work here, to find time for other diversions. Oh, that is, if a man wants to keep up with the, the newspapers. The corners of the wide mouth lifted in what Mr. Crabtree hoped was a smile. That is precisely what I hoped to hear you say. Facts, Mr. Crabtree. Facts. I wanted a man with a single-minded interest in facts. And your words now, as well as your application to your work, mm. they tell me I have found him in you. I am very gratified, Mr. Crabtree. Mr. Crabtree found that the blood was thumping pleasantly through his veins. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Spelvin. I know I've been trying very hard, but I, I, I didn't know whether... <laughs> Won't you sit down? Mr. Crabtree tried to get his arm around the barrel before him in order to swing the chair into position and failed. Uh, the office is a bit small. Oh, oh but, but very comfortable, he stammered hastily. I am sure it is suitable, said Mr. Spelvin. He stepped back until he was almost fixed against the window and indicated the chair. Now, I should like you to be seated, Mr. Crabtree, while I discuss the matter I came on. Under the spell of that commanding hand, Mr. Crabtree sank into the chair and pivoted it until he faced the window and the squat figure outlined against it. If there is uh, any question about today's report, he said, 
I'm afraid it isn't complete yet. There were some notes on efficiency instruments. Mr. Spelvin waved the matter aside indifferently. I am not here to discuss that, he said slowly. I am here to find the answer to a problem which confronts me. And I rely on you, Mr. Crabtree, to help me find that answer. A problem? Mr. Crabtree found himself warm with a sense of well-being. I'll do everything I can to help, Mr. Spelvin, everything I possibly can. The bulging eyes probed his worriedly. Then uh, tell me this, Mr. Crabtree. How would you go about killing a man? Stay with us. We'll be right back. The bulging eyes probed his worriedly. Then tell me this, Mr. Crabtree. How would you go about killing a man? I? said Mr. Crabtree. How would I go? Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand, Mr. Spelvin. I said, Mr. Spelvin repeated, carefully stressing each word, how would you go about killing a man? Mr. Crabtree's jaw dropped, but I, I couldn't, I wouldn't. That, he said, that would be murder. Exactly said Mr. Spelman. Oh, but you're joking, said Mr. Crabtree, and tried to laugh, without managing to get more than a thin, breathless wheeze through his constricted throat. Even that pitiful effort was cut short by the sight of the stony face before him. I I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Spelman, terribly sorry, you can see it's not the customary... Well, it's not the kind of thing... Mr. Crabtree, in the financial journals you study so assiduously, you will find my name, my own name, repeated endlessly. I have a finger in many pies, Mr. Crabtree, and it always prods the plum. To use the more blatant adjectives, I am wealthy and powerful, far beyond your wildest dreams, granting that you are capable of wild dreams. And a man does not attain that position by idling his time away on pointless jokes, or in passing the time of day with hirelings. My time is limited, Mr. Crabtree. If you cannot answer my question, say so, and let it go at that. I don't believe I can, said Mr. Crabtree, piteously. You should have said that at once, Mr. Spelvin replied, and spared me my moment of color. Frankly, I did not believe you could answer my question. 
And if you had, it would have been a most disillusioning experience. You see, Mr. Crabtree, I envy, I deeply envy your serenity of existence where such questions never even enter. Unfortunately, I am not in that position. At one point in my career, I made a mistake, the only mistake that has ever marked my rise to fortune. And this, in time, came to the attention of a man who combines ruthlessness and cleverness to a dangerous degree. And I have been in the power of that man since. He is, in fact, a blackmailer, a common blackmailer who has come to set too high a price on his wares. And so must now pay for them himself. Y you intend, said Mr. Crabtree hoarsely, to kill him? Mr. Spelvin threw out a plump hand in protest. Oh, if a fly rested in the palm of that hand, he said. I could not find the power to close my fingers and crush the life from it. To be blunt, Mr. Crabtree, I am totally incapable of committing an act of violence. And while that may be an admirable quality in many ways, it is merely an embarrassment now, since the man must certainly be killed. Mr. Spelvin paused. Nor is this a task for a paid assassin. If I resorted to one, I would most assuredly be exchanging one blackmailer for another, and that is altogether impractical. Mr. Spelvin paused again. So, Mr. Crabtree, you can see there is only one conclusion to be drawn. The responsibility for destroying my tormentor rests entirely on you. Me! cried Mr. Crabtree. Why, I could never, no, never. Oh, come said Mr. Spelvin brusquely. You are working yourself into a dangerous state. Before you carry it any further, Mr. Crabtree, I should like to make it clear that your failure to carry out my request means that when you leave this office today, you leave it permanently. I cannot tolerate an employee who does not understand his position. Not tolerate, said Mr. Crabtree. But that is not right. Th that is not right at all, Mr. Spelvin. I've been working hard. His spectacles blurred. He fumbled with them, cleaned them carefully, replaced them on his nose, and... To leave me with such a secret? Well, I don't see, I don't see it at all. Why, he said in alarm, it's a matter for the police. To his horror, Mr. Spelvin's face turned alarmingly red, and the huge body started to shake in a convulsion of mirth that rang deafeningly through the room. <clears throat> Forgive me, <laughs> he managed to gasp at last. Forgive me, my dear fellow. <sighs> oh, for I was merely visualizing <sighs> the scene in which you 
go to the authorities and tell them of the incredible demands upon you by your employer. Well, you must understand, said Mr. Crabtree. I'm not threatening you, Mr. Spelman. It's only... Threatening me? Oh, Mr. Crabtree. Now tell me, what connection do you think there is between us in the eyes of the world? Connection? I, I work for you, Mr. Spelvin. I'm, I'm an employee here. I... Mr. Spelvin smiled blandly. What a curious delusion, he said. When one can see that you are merely a shabby little man engaged in some pitiful little enterprise that could not possibly be of interest to me. But you employed me yourself, Mr. Spelvin. I wrote a letter of application. You did, said Mr. Spelvin. But unfortunately, the position was already filled. And as I informed you in my very polite letter of explanation, uh, you look incredulous, Mr. Crabtree. So let me inform you that your letter and a copy of my reply rest securely in my files should the matter ever be called to question. But, but... This office, th these furnishings, my subscriptions. Mr. Crabtree, Mr. Crabtree, said Mr. Spelvin, shaking his head heavily. Did you ever question the source of your weekly income? The manager of this building, the dealers in supplies, the publishers who deliver their journals to you were no more interested in my identity than you were. It is, I grant, a bit irregular for me to deal exclusively in currency sent through the mails in your name. But have no fears for me, Mr. Crabtree. Prompt payments are the opiate of the businessman. But my reports, said Mr. Crabtree, who was seriously starting to doubt his own existence. To be sure, the reports. I dare say that the ingenious Mr. Crabtree, after receiving my unfavorable reply to his application, decided to go into business for himself. He thereupon instituted a service of financial reports and even attempted to make me one of his clients. I rebuffed him sharply. I can tell you, I have his first report and a copy of my reply to it, but he foolishly persists in his efforts. Foolishly, I say, because his reports are absolutely useless to me. I have no interest in any of the corporations he discusses. And why he should imagine I would, that's beyond my reckoning. Frankly, I suspect the man is an eccentric of the worst type, but... Since I have had dealings with many of that type, I merely disregard him and destroy his daily reports. Destroy them upon their arrival. Destroy them, said Mr. Crabtree, stupefied. Well, you have no cause for complaint, I hope, said Mr. Spelvin with some annoyance. To find a man of your character, Mr. Crabtree, it was necessary for me to specify hard work in my advertisement. I am only living up to my part of the bargain 
in providing it. And I fail to see where the final disposition of it is any of your concern. A man of my character? echoed Mr. Crabtree helplessly. To commit murder. And why not? The wide mouth tightened ominously. Let me enlighten you, Mr. Crabtree. I have spent a pleasant and profitable share of my life in observing the human species, as a scientist might study insects under glass. And I have come to one conclusion, Mr. Crabtree, one above all others, which has contributed to the making of my own success. I have come to the conclusion that, to the majority of our species, it is the function that is important, not the motives nor the consequences. My advertisement, Mr. Crabtree, was calculated to enlist the services of one like that, a perfect representative of the type, in fact. From the moment you answered that advertisement to the present, you have been living up to all my expectations. You have been functioning flawlessly, with no thought of either motive or consequence. Now, murder has been made part of your function. I have honored you with an explanation of its motives. The consequences are clearly defined. Either you continue to function as you always have, or, to put it in a nutshell, you are out of a job. A job, said Mr. Crabtree, wildly. What does a job matter to a man in prison or to a man being hanged? Oh, come remarked Mr. Spelvin placidly. Do you think I would lead you into a trap which might snare me as well? I am afraid you are being obtuse, my dear man. If you are not, you must realize clearly that my own security is tied in the same package as yours and nothing less than your permanent presence in this office and your steadfast application to your work is the guarantee of that security. Oh, that may be easy to say when you're hiding under an assumed name, said Mr. Crabtree hollowly. I assure you, Mr. Crabtree, my position in the world is such that my identity can be unearthed with small effort. But I must also remind you that should you carry out my request, you will then be a criminal and consequently very discreet. On the other hand, if you do not carry out my request, and you have complete freedom of choice in that, any charges you may bring against me will be dangerous. Only to you, the world, Mr. Crabtree, knows nothing about our relationship and nothing about my affair with the gentleman who has been victimizing me 
and must now become my victim. Neither his demise nor your charges could ever touch me, Mr. Crabtree. Discovering my identity, as I said, would not be difficult. But using that information, Mr. Crabtree, can only lead you to a prison or an institution for the deranged. Mr. Crabtree felt the last dregs of his strength seeping from him. You have thought of everything, he said. Everything, Mr. Crabtree. When you entered my scheme of things, it was only to put my plan into operation. But long before that, I was hard at work, weighing, measuring, evaluating every step of that plan. For example, this room, this very room, has been chosen only after a long and weary search as perfect for my purpose. Its furnishings have been selected and arranged to further that purpose. How? Let me explain that. When you are seated at your desk, a visitor is confined to the space I now occupy at the window. The visitor is, of course, the gentleman in question. He will enter and stand here with the window entirely open behind him. He will ask you for an envelope a friend has left. This envelope, said Mr. Spelvin tossing one to the desk. You will have the envelope in your desk. We'll find it and hand it to him. Then, since he is a very methodical man, I have learned that well. He will place the envelope in the inside pocket of his jacket. And at that moment, one good thrust will send him out the window. The entire operation should take less than a minute. Immediately after that, Mr. Spelvin said calmly, You will... Close the window to the bottom and return to your work. Someone, whispered Mr. Crabtree, the police will find, said Mr. Spelvin, the body of some poor unfortunate who climbed the stairs across the hallway and hurled himself from the roof above. And they will know this because inside that envelope secured in his pocket is not what the gentleman in question expects to find there, but a neatly typewritten note explaining the sad affair and its motives, an apology for any inconvenience caused. Oh, suicides are great ones for apologies, Mr. Crabtree. And a most pathetic plea for a quick and peaceful burial. And, said Mr. Spelvin, 
gently touching his fingertips together. I do not doubt he will get it. What? Mr. Crabtree said. What? If um, something went wrong, if the man opened the letter when it was given to him, or if something like that happened, Mr. Spelvin shrugged. In that case, the gentleman in question would merely make his way off quietly and approach me directly about the matter. Realize, Mr. Crabtree, that anyone in my friend's line of work expects occasional little attempts like this. And while he may not be inclined to think them amusing, he would hardly venture into some precipitous action that might kill the goose who lays the golden eggs. No, Mr. Crabtree, if such a possibility as you suggest comes to pass, it means only that I must reset my trap, and even more ingeniously. Mr. Spelvin drew a heavy watch from his pocket, studied it, and then replaced it carefully. My time is growing short, Mr. Crabtree. It is not that I find your company wearing, but my man will be making his appearance shortly and matters must be entirely in your hands at that time. All I require of you is that when he arrives, the window will be open. Mr. Spelvin thrust it up hard and stood for a moment, looking appreciatively at the drop below. The envelope will be in your desk. He opened the drawer and dropped it in, then closed the drawer firmly. And at the moment of decision, you are free to act one way or the other. Free, said Mr. Crabtree. You said, you said he would ask for the envelope. He will. He will indeed, but if you indicate that you know nothing about it, he will quietly make his departure and later communicate with me, and that will be, in effect, a notice of your resignation from my employ. Mr. Spelvin went to the door and rested one hand on the knob. However, he said, if I do not hear from him, that will assure me that you have successfully completed your term of probation and are to be henceforth regarded as a capable and faithful employee. But uh, the reports, said Mr. Crabtree, you destroy them. Of course, said Mr. Spelvin, a little surprised. But you will continue with your work and send the reports to me as you have always done. I assure you it does not matter to me that they are meaningless, Mr. Crabtree. They are part of a pattern, and your adherence to that pattern, as I have already told you, is the best assurance of my own security. The door opened closed, quietly, and Mr. Crabtree found himself alone in the room.
the shadow of the building opposite lay heavily on his desk. Mr. Crabtree looked at his watch, found himself unable to read it in the growing dimness of the room and stood up to pull the cord of the light over his head. At that moment, a peremptory knock sounded on the door. uh, Come in, said Mr. Crabtree. The door opened on two figures. One was a small, dapper man, the other a bulky police officer who loomed imposingly over his companion. The small man stepped into the office and with the gesture of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat, withdrew a large wallet from his pocket, snapped it open to show the gleam of a badge, closed it and slid it back into his pocket. Police, said the man, succinctly. Name's Sharp. Mr. Crabtree nodded politely. Yes, he said. Hope you don't mind, said Sharp, briskly. Just a few questions. As if this were a cue, the large policeman came up with an efficient-looking notebook and the stub of a pencil and stood there, poised for action. Mr. Crabtree peered over his spectacles at the notebook and threw them at the diminutive sharp. No, um, said Mr. Crabtree, not not at all. You're Crabtree, said Sharp, and Mr. Crabtree started, and then he remembered the name on the door. Yes, he said. Sharp's cold eyes flickered over him and then took in the room with a contemptuous glance. This is your office? Yes, said Mr. Crabtree. You in it all afternoon? Uh, Since one o'clock, said Mr. Crabtree. I go to lunch at twelve and return at one promptly. (laughs) I'll bet, said Sharp then nodded over his shoulder. That door open any time this afternoon? Oh, it's always closed while I'm working, said Mr. Crabtree. Then uh, you wouldn't be able to see anybody going up that stair across the hall there. No, replied Mr. Crabtree. I wouldn't. Sharp looked at the desk, then ran a reflective thumb along his jaw. Well, I guess you wouldn't be in a position to see anything happening outside the window either. No, indeed, said Mr. Crabtree. Not while I'm at work. Now, said Sharp, did you hear something outside of that window this afternoon? Something out of the ordinary, I mean. Out of the ordinary, repeated Mr. Crabtree. Vaguely, yeah, a yell, somebody yelling, anything like that. Mr. Crabtree puckered his brow. Why, yes, he said. Yes, I did, and um, not long ago either. It sounded as if someone had been startled or frightened. Quite loud, too. It's always so quiet here. I I couldn't help hearing it. Sharp looked over his shoulder and nodded at the policeman, who closed his notebook slowly. Now, that ties it up, said Sharp. That guy, he made the jump, and the second he did it, he changed his mind. (laughs) So he came down, hollering all the way. Well, he said, turning to Mr. Crabtree in a burst of confidence. I guess you've got a right to know what's going on here. About an hour ago, some character jumped off that roof right over your head. 
The clear case of suicide, note in his pocket and everything, but, yeah, you know, we like to get all the facts we can. Do you know, said Mr. Crabtree, who he was? Sharp shrugged. Oh, another guy with too many troubles. Young, good-looking, pretty snappy dresser. Only thing beats me is why a guy who could afford to dress like that would figure he has more troubles than he can handle. The policeman in uniform spoke for the first time. Ah, that letter he left, oof, he said deferentially. It sounds like he was a little crazy. Now you have to be a little crazy to take that way out, said Sharp. Oh, yeah. Well, you're a long time dead, said the policeman, heavily. Sharp held the doorknob momentarily. Well, sorry to bother you, he said to Mr. Crabtree. But you know how it is. Anyhow, you're lucky in a way. A couple of girls downstairs saw him go by. Passed right out. He winked as he closed the door behind him. Mr. Crabtree stood looking at the closed door until the sound of heavy footsteps passed out of hearing. Then he seated himself in the chair and pulled himself closer to the desk. Some magazines and sheets of stationery lay there in mild disarray, and he arranged the magazines in a neat pile, stacking them so that all corners met precisely. Mr. Crabtree picked up his pen, dipped it into the ink bottle, and steadied the paper before him with his other hand. Efficiency instruments limited, he wrote carefully. Shows increased activity. Introduction information for this episode is from The Unconventional Private Eyes of Stanley Ellen by J. Kingston Pierce for Crime Reads and other sources from our show notes. Music for today is Light of the Seven by Ramin Jawadi The Artifact and Living by Michael Andrews Gabriella's Video by Marco Beltrami Delicate by Chad Lawson and Scatuma by Christopher Young. Remember, you can reach me at Fast Asleep with Gina Marie 44 at gmail.com, or you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And please keep us here for you with your comments, your likes and by subscribing. Thank you for listening. Keyword. Envelope.